Crime and Punishment uh, was published in the middle of the 1860s, and from that time onward all the way through the 1870s, uh, Dostoevsky was very much concerned with the problems of sin and Christian faith. Of course, by that time, he'd become an ardent supporter of the, of the Tsarist regime and the Russian Orthodox Church, which was very closely connected with the Tsarist regime. And yet, at the very same time, he understood the force of the atheist argument, which was so popular among the Russian intelligentsia at that time. He gave a tremendous amount of thought and energy to the notion of constructing a character who would somehow cut through this problem, uh, who would, uh, by the force of his own personality, the force of his own uh, psychology, make an expression that would be convincing both in terms of Christian faith and also as an answer to the arguments of the atheists and the intellectuals who were becoming increasingly impressive and powerful in Russia at that time. In order to do this, uh, he went back to a form that was very popular in Russia earlier. Remember when we dealt with the Kievan Rus, we talked a little bit about this. He went back to the notion of the lives of the saints. You understand there were two different kinds of saints that they dealt with in those days. On the one hand, there was the saint who, as it were, was born with the, uh, with the halo uh, nailed to his head uh, when he, uh, from birth. Who's, even whose parents realized they had someone very, very holy among them, whose uh, uh, playmates uh, bowed down to him because they realized that he was holy. Uh, his sainthood went with him through, the entire, through his entire life. Uh, he was always uh, the same. On the other hand, there was a very different kind of saint who started out as almost a kind of a little devil who as a young child uh, was uh, very badly behaved, who was a young man uh, engaged in debauch, engaged in all the terrible things that the church teaches against, uh, who uh, lived what might be called a life of sin, and then all of a sudden, at a particular time, usually when uh, in adolescence or in uh, early adulthood, was suddenly faced with a blinding insight of what faith was. And as bad a person as that person had previously been, that much of a saint he was in the future. And of course, that, that, that person who has, as it were, sinned his way to sainthood was a character that appealed deeply to Dostoevsky because he thought this was the kind of a person who could really understand what human life was about and how to bring sanctity to human life in spite of the fact that a part of his personality also included those terribly sinful things that belonged in the character of any human being. While he was going through this, and uh, going through all kinds of experiments of a kind of a novel that he might write in dealing with this, by the way, uh, uh, recorded in a series of articles called uh, uh, Diary of a Writer, which has become very popular uh, in modern times. It's a kind of a workshop of Dostoevsky's ideas. Uh, a terrible thing happened. In May of 1878, he faced a terrible loss. He had had a young son named Alexei. Of course, the nickname for Alexei is Alyosha. And for some reason or other, I don't quite know why, Dostoevsky believed that this child was the one who had inherited the talent of the father. He gave enormous attention to the child. He felt very close to the child. He liked to play with him, even as a very small infant. And uh, that particular day in May, he had been playing with him for an hour or so, and then the child was tired, so he lay him down in the crib so he would go to sleep. And uh, while he was, the child was just about to go to sleep, suddenly he was struck with terrible convulsions, and he died before the eyes of his parents. Uh, when the doctors came, they realized that these convulsions were caused by epilepsy, obviously a disease inherited directly from Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky's grief was profound, and Anna Grigorievna really feared for his sanity, feared for his health, which even without this was not the very best at that time, uh, given the life that he had led. And so she took him to a very famous monastery in Russia in those days, a place named Optina Pustin, which was connected not only with Dostoevsky, but with quite a few major Russian writers at that time. And uh, at that monastery, Dostoevsky made the acquaintance of an elder. In those days, uh, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church gave place and uh, position uh, to people who were called elders. They seemed to have a particular kind of sanctity, a particular understanding of human beings, a particular ability to deal with troubled people and to bring them to faith, things like that. The man's name was Father Ambrosi, and of course he had naturally heard a great deal about Dostoevsky. He was a very famous writer by that time. He gave him quite a bit of time, and they talked about Dostoevsky's troubles at considerable length. Evidently, Ambrosi was a very acute psychologist, and he knew how to deal with people in grief. Uh, when Dostoevsky returned from the visit, uh, he came back in a much more settled frame, frame of mind, ready to continue work on what was going to become probably his greatest novel. 
As a matter of fact, many of the words of Father Ambrosi show up in the character of Father Zosima, the elder, in the Brothers Karamazov. In the scene where troubled women are coming to visit him, some of the things that he tells them are exactly what Father Ambrosi had told Dostoevsky. Clearly, many of the experiences that Dostoevsky experienced in the late 1870s come into the novel, and obviously the character of Alyosha, to a certain extent at least, has some connection with the Alyosha, who was Dostoevsky's young son and who died of epilepsy. The novel is dedicated, and quite rightly so, I think, to Anna Grigorievna, Dostoevsky's wife, uh, Dostoevsky's second wife, that is. It seems to me very clear that without her love, without her constancy, and without all of the things that she did for him, in spite of the fact that she was 20 years younger than he was, uh, without that, I doubt very much that he would have written his great novels. She certainly deserves what she got in having that great novel de dedicated to her. Later on, rather sadly, at the time of the revolution, she died after having been very, very hungry in a place where there was famine for a week. Somebody found a, a loaf of freshly baked bread, of hot freshly baked bread. They gave it to her. Uh, this is, of course, many years later, in 1917. They gave it to her. She fell upon it as only a hungry person would fall upon it, and she died from the expansion of that hot bread inside of her stomach. It's a very sad story, a very sad ending to a really a great uh, individual, a great woman. The epigraph is very important. The epigraph is taken from the book of John, the Gospel, the chapter 12, the verse 24, a very famous sentence where he says, unless a seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. Of course, what he's referring to there is the phenomenon of winter wheat, uh, which is planted uh, uh, just before the winter comes on, what he's saying is that as long as it lies under the ground fallow and doesn't sprout, it will come up at the proper time. But of course, if there's a, an early thaw, if there's an unexpected uh, uh, warm spell, suddenly that seed will sprout, and of course when the cold comes again, it will kill it. So in order to bring forth fruit, in order to bring forth the wheat, it has to die, it has to seem to die, that is lying under the ground fallow for uh, three or perhaps even four months until the spring comes, and then it suddenly comes up. Clearly, this is a parable with which the gospel tries to handle the, the theme of resurrection. And, of course, the theme of resurrection is enormously important uh, in the course of this novel. Furthermore, there's a, a rather ironic introduction in the author's introduction of the man he calls his protagonist, that is Alyosha Karamazov. Now, with, uh, among critics, there's been a tremendous amount of argument as to just exactly who is the real protagonist of this novel, which one of the brothers, of the four brothers, is the real protagonist. And many people go for Ivan and for Dmitri, but Dostoevsky says it's Alyosha, and I'm one who tends to take an author uh, at his word. I know there are critics who think that they know much more about the novel than the author does, but I am not among those people. It seems to me that it's the author who wrote the novel and he knows what he wants to do, particularly when he has the intelligence of Dostoevsky. But it's interesting that Dostoevsky introduces his, the man he calls Giroi, that's the Russian word for hero, with irony. He says, well, so people will ask me, uh, what has he done to make him a hero? Has he done something great? Uh, to whom and by what? Uh, but for, why do you call him uh, your hero? Why do you call him a special person? And Dostoevsky says, well, I'm talking about a certain kind of clarity, but of course it's, it's very difficult to talk about clarity in our times. You may remember the verse that I quoted from Pushkin about clarity. His song was clear. His song was, the idea of clarity was something that was very much accepted in Pushkin's time, was nowhere nearly so well accepted in Dostoevsky's time. And of course, in the beginning of the novel, Dostoevsky introduces us to the central, well, one of the central characters, Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, that is the, uh, the father of these three sons. He's a debauched sensual sensualist. Uh, he's a man who's evil in many ways, and yet I think it's very clear that he's the most intelligent character in the novel. As nasty as he is, his intelligence manages to cut through all of the uh, deceiving parts, all of the places that aren't clear in the novel, and of course he had two wives, one of them a kind of blue stocking who kind of lorded it over him, a highly intelligent woman who eventually flees from the old man. She has sense enough to get away. The second is a much weaker woman, a somewhat sickly woman, uh, but nevertheless very, very religious woman, to whom for some reason or other he's attracted. The uh, blue stocking was the mother of Dmitri, the oldest son, the one who turns out to be a sensualist like his father. 
the uh, second one, Safiya, uh, the, more, the weaker one, the, the one who is in some ways kind of half mad, a kind of a, in some ways almost a holy fool, is the mother both of Ivan, uh, the second son, and Alyosha, the third son. And then, of course, there's also a fourth son. But before I talk about that, I think I should say something about Dmitri. Dmitri, of course, uh, is a sensualist, a, a very strong sensualist, and he falls in love with a woman for whom the father is also falling in love, in spite of the fact he's been married several times. And, of course, there's a conflict between them over the same woman. This has a lot to do with suspicions about Dmitri after the father is found murdered. Then, of course, there's a fourth son called Smirdyakov. You remember we talked about, the, in the previous lecture, I talked about uh, uh, the, the body of Lazarus smelling in the tomb. The, the uh, Old Church Slavic form of the Bible uses the word smurdjit, a, a particular kind of stench that a dead body has. And this young man is called Smirdyakov, or the stinking one, because he's the son of a woman who is a holy fool, one of the Yuradjivois that we talked about before, holy fool in Christ, stinking Lizaveta, or Smirdyashchaya Lizaveta. That's why he's Smirdyakov. On a dare, the old man, Fyodor Pavlovich, who says, there is no such thing as an ugly woman. There's no such thing as a woman who lacks attractiveness. Womanhood means to be attractive. They said, well, could you, could you have sexual relations with that uh, stinking Lizaveta over there? He said, yes, I can. And he actually uh, did it. And the result of that was the birth of his fourth son. Uh, in, she dies in childbirth, but she gets close to his house to give birth to the child, so they know that it's uh, uh, Fyodor Pavlovich's son, Smerdyakov, the fourth son. Alyosha is the focus of, uh, th there's a time in the novel, in the beginning of the novel, when the brothers come together. They all come back after many, many years of growing up. They come back to their father's house, and somehow the focus of all of their attentions is on Alyosha. Alyosha is a strange sort of person to be found in, the, in a family like the Karamazovs. As a matter of fact, uh, Alyosha wants to be a monk, and he's already a novice in the monastery uh, that's near uh, the house of the father. Curiously, the old man Fyodor Pavlovich, this, this uh, sensualist, this lecher, this old uh, man who in many ways is a, a very ugly kind of personality, sees the goodness of Alyosha. Alyosha becomes his favorite. He realizes that among all of his sons, Alyosha is the one who will be kind to him. Alyosha is the one who will be kind to the world. And this evil Karamazov sees in Alyosha the decent sort of a person he actually is. It's remarkable the way his intelligence comes through at that point. Dmitri, on the other hand, as, uh, some, there's of course one other important thing about Alyosha. At one point, He's asked by a skeptic uh, a man named Rakiti, and he says, Alyosha, don't you realize that there's a murder brewing in your family? Uh, Alyosha says, yes, I do. He says, aha, so you're not quite the kindly, uh, naive young man they take you for. He says, well, why don't you do something about it? And Alyosha replies, I can't, I won't. Aha, uh -huh, says Rakiti, you're a Karamazov too. Dostoevsky goes out of his way to show that even the saintly Alyosha Karamazov, as kind as he is, is nevertheless a Karamazov. Uh, Dmitri is a sensualist, as I said before, who competes with his father for the infernal woman, uh, the infernalnitsa of the novel, a woman named Grushenka, or a woman nicknamed Grushenka, which means a particularly succulent kind of a pear. At one point, there's a quarrel in the house where Dmitri actually physically attacks his father and beats him beats him so that the father bleeds, and you realize that there is really bad blood between father and son. Later on, when uh, the old man is talking to Ivan about Dmitri and, and, and complaining about the way Dmitri deals with him, uh, he also talks about the mother of Alyosha. He says, you know, the mother was just like Alyosha. Uh, she could get into a sort of holy fit, and then the only way I could bring her back to uh, normality was to spit in her face, was to spit water upon her. And Ivan turns and says, you seem to forget that that woman is not only the mother of Alyosha, but also my mother. And the old man says, no, wait a minute. Oh, yes, that's right. And he realizes how angry Ivan is at him, and he fears Ivan, and it turns out rightfully so, fears Ivan very deeply.